Margie and Gillian were making chocolate chip cookies. It wasn't a good day for chocolate chip cookies because it was so hot, they probably could have fried the cookies in the street. But Jake had asked for homemade chocolate chip cookies, and Margie wasn't going to say no. So Margie and Gillian were sweating together in the little kitchen. Margie had told Gillian she didn't have to help, but Gillian insisted. She said she might sweat off a pound or two, but Margie knew Gillian was there to offer more moral support. It was a good thing she was there. For as long as Margie had worked for Evan, she knew the cool was a possibility. Even so, she never expected it. She was so caught up in Jake that she tended to forget about Evan's precarious world. Oh no, I know what's going to happen. So when it came, she wasn't prepared. Oh no! I know exactly where this is going. Especially since it came from Michael. Margie, Michael said when she um, answered the phone. His flat, gruff voice was unmistakable. Hi, Michael. I have just been notified that Evan's dead. Margie's legs had failed her. If Gillian hadn't been in the kitchen with her, she would have whacked her head on the counter as, as she went down. Instead, she fell into Gillian, who, though sturdy, was a lot softer than a counter. Gillian immediately wrapped her arms around Margie and propped her up. Apparently an IED hit the vehicle he was in, Michael said. Margie gripped the phone and tried to breathe. She'd only met Michael. I've actually got the chills. She'd only met Michael the one time and she knew the way he processed the world was very different from what was normal. But hearing the news this way was, you there? Michael asked. She tried to speak, couldn't. She cleared her throat. Here. I've got Evan's will here. He named you Jake's guardian and he left you the house and some savings. I'm the executor. I'll follow the proper procedures and file what must be filed and I'll bring you papers to sign when they're ready. Margie couldn't find a word in their brain that made sense. Julian took the phone from her hand. The reason I I kind of reacted really big there is because his dad isn't alive anymore. Therefore, he isn't going to be able to talk to um Simon. And that's going to have... Oh, God. Okay. Okay. This is, this is, a, this is going to be a really serious <laughs> ending, I, I can tell. Um, Margie's voice didn't work again for an hour. Gillian filled in the gap. When, while Margie was sat in a hard ladder back chair at the oak pedestal table near the kitchen, Gillian coaxed more details out of Michael, checked on Jake, got Margie a glass of water, finished the cookies and brought a load of laundry up from the basement to fold. Gillian didn't start to cry until she began folding Jake's t-shirts into neat little squares. Margie had been crying off and on all the time. After the laundry was stacked, the women sat together, holding hands and staring at the table. Margie's mind was blank. Well, not completely blank. She was trying to figure out how to get her tongue to work in concert with her throat and her gums again. Eventually, she found her voice. I'm not crying about Evan, Margie said. Julian looked up and nodded. I know. Margie wiped her eyes. That sounds awful, though. I, I mean, I'm devastated that he's gone, of course. She sniffled. Julian pushed a box of tissues closer to Margie, who ignored it and wiped her nose with the back of her hand. It's Jake I'm upset about. Margie dropped her face into her hands. How am I going to tell him? Her words, muffled by her palms, were as mushy as her thoughts. Julian put her hand on Margie's shoulder. Margie looked up. His oncology team doesn't think he has much longer, she whispered, as if saying the words in a normal tone would hasten it would hasten their truth into being. Julian pressed her lips together and her eyes filled. I've known Jake since he was a tyke. Her voice was broken. She cleared her throat. Evan and Roxanne moved in here when Jake was two. Even then, he was creative and kind. She smiled. I love my kids but they're oafs by comparison. It breaks my heart. She shook her head and smacked the table, but it doesn't do any good to try and figure it out or lament what it is. Um, all we can do is go forward from here. Um, before we do go forward, 
I just want to point out Roxanne. Uh, <laughs> I know Scott loves to re reuse names, and I don't think this means anything, but Roxanne Wolf is, na is a character in Security Breach. I know that probably doesn't mean anything, okay? Don't at me. Uh, Scott loves to reuse names for whatever reason, but that was just something that I picked up on when I read Roxanne. Anyway. Margie nodded, wanting to do pretty much anything but go forward from here. So, I'm going to fix some lemonade, Julian said. We're going to drink it, and then you'll figure out the best time to tell Jake. Margie nodded again. She felt like he was outside of herself, watching her body do things like nod and sit and fold laundry. She felt separate from this ordinary self. Getting the news about Evan had untethered her from day-to-day -day concerns. It's good Michael will handle Evan's estate. Julian cut into a lemon. The tart scent filled the room, and it lured Margie part way back into her body. I've never met Michael. He seemed a little, well, cool on the phone. He's a numbers genius, manages money for wealthy people, and has made a kill killing doing it. She wiped her face. He's not a bad guy. He just doesn't know how to connect. He doesn't feel the way we do. I might envy him, Julian said. Me too. The shy robot knew he had to speak up about the glitch. If he didn't, the ship would clash, but he couldn't find his voice. All he could do was make little beeping sounds. Margie cleared her throat, and then she and then used a very squeaky voice to say, Bleep, blippity bleep bleep, bloopity blip blip bloop. Jake's tried to smile because he knew it was supposed to be funny, but smiling took more energy than he had. Jake was only half listening to Margie's story. In spite of her attempts to get him comfy again, he was feeling so not comfy that listening was hard, and the story wasn't great either. Usually, Margie told awesome stories, exciting stories filled with interesting characters doing cool things, but tonight, Margie's characters were boring. The shy robot was kind of stupid, not that he'd tell that, her that, of course. But he could tell her he was tired, so he did. Margie frowned and leaned toward Jake. She tilted her, she tilted her head to study his face. Then she picked up his wrist to check his pulse. Her skin was sweaty and her hair clung to her neck and the sides of her cheeks, even though the fan tried to blow it around. Jake thought of the fan as a knight battling a dragon spewing hot fire breath over everything in the room. Tonight, the knight was losing, big time. Margie let go of Jake's wrist and fussed over his IV line. A nurse had come that morning to put it in because he couldn't keep his food down. Um, the needle in the back of his hand pinched and stung. He hated it, but he didn't complain. He also didn't complain about the catheter. <laughs> What's that? Uh, he hated it even more than the IV, but he was too weak to take care of things himself, and he was way too old to wet the bed. What can I get for you? Margie asked. Nothing. I just want to go to sleep. Margie chewed on her lower lip for a second, then nodded and handed him Bodhi. Even though Jake knew Bodhi would make him feel hotter, he gathered his, his pulse bat, uh, his pulse, his plush bat close. It wasn't true that he wanted to go to sleep. What he wanted was Simon. He was really excited about talking to Simon today because he'd thought of some cool things he did today. It had been so hot all day. It had felt like the air wasn't even air anymore. It was lava flowing around the room, choking whatever it touched. Jake was having trouble breathing. But even though he was lying in bed, too weak to do more than lift his hand, he decided that he wanted to be on the beach. If he was on the beach in heat like this, he could jump into the ocean and cool off. Maybe he could body surf or even learn to surf for real. He couldn't wait to tell Simon that he did that. Margie bent over Jake and kissed his forehead. Her breath smelled funny. On that surface, it smelled like lemonade, but under that good smell was something bad, something kind of like vomit. Or maybe that was his own breath he was smelling. He'd thrown up that icky yellow stuff a couple times this afternoon. Jake closed his eyes, and as usual, Margie didn't leave the room. She stood by his bed and watched him. He kept his eyes closed and waited. Once, he heard a faint shuffle and he moved, and he opened one eye to a slit to see if Margie had moved. She hadn't. She just shifted position. What seemed like several minutes went by. He thought he heard a sob and he was tempted to open his eyes and look at Margie, but he remained still. Jake? 
he opened his eyes. Margie had never spoken to him after he closed his eyes. What? <sighs> I don't think Simon is going to visit tonight. <laughs> Sorry, this is actually hitting me really hard. <laughs> I apologise if this um, this ending is like really slow and it takes me a while to get through this, but I'm actually kind of really sad about this. I'm actually going to tear up. Um, that line is really effective. I don't think Simon is going to visit tonight. Jake blinked at her. How do you know Simon visits at bedtime? Oh my god. It's just the innocence. Margie winked at him. He was sure the wink was supposed to be cheerful, but it looked wrong. Kind of twisted and out of place. I'm that good, kiddo. Her words didn't sound right either. The usual lilt in her voice had been flattened by something Jake could understand. No, seriously. Jake wasn't in the mood to be teased, especially when the teasing wasn't even done right. Margie sat on the edge of the bed. I've heard you talking to him through the door, she admitted. You were listening? It's my job to be sure you're okay. When I hear something going on in your room, I have to check it out. Jake thought about that. It was fine, he decided. It's not like he was telling Simon secrets. He didn't mind Margie knowing all the fun stuff the real Jake had been doing. He frowned. But why isn't he coming tonight? Margie blinked several times and swallowed. Well, he just... He just can't come tonight. You know... You know how sometimes you're just not up to doing things you want to do? Jake nodded. It's like that. Jake rubbed his eyes so they wouldn't give away how upset he was. For some reason, he didn't want Margie to know he was disappointed. It's okay, he told Margie. She nodded. Are you sure you don't want me to finish the story? He shook his head and closed his eyes again. I'll just go to sleep. She leaned over and kissed him again. Her cheek touched his. Hers was wet. <sighs> getting through this. <laughs> We're getting through this. Oh my god. This is, not going to lie, this is the saddest story I have read so far and it's not even finished. Whoa, okay. This is really good. This is so, this is a really good story. I'm really enjoying this. Margie barely made it to Jake's door before her legs gave out. She quickly pulled the door shut behind her and she slid down the wall to the floor, landing like a rag doll, her legs splayed out on the hardwood. Her sweaty skin squeaked against the, uh, against the wood polish. The tears she tried to hold back in Jake's room, the ones that she had that had startled to uh, sorry, the ones that had started to slip down her cheeks in spite of her determination that they wouldn't fall, now wanted to burst from her like reservoir water freed of its dam. But she didn't let him. If she cried like she wanted to cry, Jake would hear her. She was not going to let Jake hear her cry. So she gave in to some silent sobs, her shoulders heaving. Then, grasping her hair in both hands, she just sat and rocked herself. Margie had no idea how long it took, but eventually she felt settled enough and strong enough to get off the floor. Pressing back against the wall, she leveraged herself to a standing position. Pausing for an instant to listen to the baby monitor, she started down the hall toward the bathroom, but she ended up stopping outside of Evan's door. She looked at the doorknob, then she put her hand on it. She never went in Evan's room while she was gone. Well, while he was gone, sorry. When he was home, she'd go in the room to vacuum or put away laundry or whatever. When he was gone, though, coming in here felt like an invasion of privacy. Now he was gone, and this house was hers. She still couldn't believe that. Evan's room would be her room. He'd wanted her to take it from the beginning. It makes sense. You'd be right here next to Jake and the bed's bigger, and it's cooler in the summer. Yeah, and I'd feel like I was sleeping in your bed, she thought. No thanks, I need my own space, she told him. She didn't realise until Michael gave her the news that the real issue was she wanted Evan to be more than just a boss, and being in his room when he was gone made her feel a little like a lovelorn stalker. <laughs> Love him like a brother, she snorted. Boy had, I, boy had she been lying to herself. 
Margie opened the door and stepped into Evan's room. It was just as she remembered it, filled with cherry mission-style furniture and dark green and t light tan curtains and comforter. The room felt discreetly masculine. Neat, but not too neat. The room revealed its occupant. The walls were covered in family photos. Jake's happy and then not-so-happy face uh, dominated those. The shelves were stuffed with fiction, ranging from paperback mysteries to hardcover classics, non-fiction in dozens of genres, and how-to books, revealing the ins and outs of doing everything from rebuilding a car engine to planting a garden. Obviously, Jake had gotten his insatiable desire for knowledge from his dad. Crossing to the queen-sized bed, Margie, uh, Margie? <laughs> Margie, uh, I've still got butter on my mind. Margie inhaled the slightly musty scent of the room. She was going to need to air it out. She sat down on the edge of the bed, and she immediately shot up. It was too soon. She couldn't be in here. Huh. Okay. Margie fled the room, shut the door, and strode into the bathroom. Inside, she shut the door, then blew her nose several times. She turned on the tap, ran cold water, and splashed her face. When she wiped off her face, she braved a look in the mirror. Bad move. Her makeup was smeared. That meant it was on the towel. She looked down. Yep. Brown and black smudges streaked the tan terry cloth. Reaching into the medicine cabinet, Margie got out the makeup remover and wiped her face clean. Then she gathered up the towels. She might as well do a load. She wasn't going to sleep any time soon. Margie sat up in bed. What was that? In a testament to how little she knew herself, Margie had fallen asleep in the basement lawn chair while the towels were washing. So once she'd put the towels in the dryer, she went up to bed. Wearing an, just an exercise bra and shorts, she'd lain down on top of the covers on her bed. Her fan was aimed directly at her, but all its warm air could do was tickle the tiny hairs on her arms. Margie had closed her eyes and surrendered to the oppressive oven that was her room. She'd fallen asleep almost instantly, but now she was awake again. Had she heard something? Yes, voices. She could hear voices. Light from the, outso light from the outdoor lamp and a three-quarter moon spilled into her room, through the open window above her bed. It was enough to illuminate the surface of a nightstand. Where was the baby monitor? Maggie took a breath. Maggie? I'm assuming that's either a misprint or it's another name from Margie. I don't, yeah, I'm assuming that's Margie. <laughs> Margie took a breath. She left it in the basement. Leaping out of bed, Margie left her room and padded down the stairs to the first floor. Once there, she stopped. She could still hear voices, but they were barely more than murmurs. She couldn't make out words. She couldn't identify the voices either. Were they male, female? Was it Jake? If so, who was talking to him? Instead of going down to the basement to get the baby monitor, Margie went toward Jake's room. The hallway was dark, but she could feel her way. Oh no. Running her hand along the top of the dark, wainscoting trim in the hall, she listened as she approached Jake's room. She thought the voices were getting louder, but... When she reached Jake's door, the voices went silent. Marky stood perfectly still, listening. Inside Jake's room, his fam hummed in an in undulating... What is that? In shifts from low pitch to high pitch. Um, in the kitchen, the fridge added its noise to the throbbing motor chorus, and even further away, um, Marky's fan contributed a deeper drone. Outside, a dog barked inside the house, made a cracking sound, like it was popping its knuckles, as if houses had knuckles to pop. It had taken Margie a long time to get used to the bungalow's constant rasps and groans. On dark winter nights, she sometimes wondered if the house was alive. It sounded like it was uncomfortable and it was trying to constantly shift into a better position. In the summer, it seemed more content, but it, usually, it occasionally made some inexplicable sound that froze Margie in her tracks. But sounds were sounds, voices were voices, and Margie was no longer hearing voices. She put her hand on Jake's door, tempted to open it and go in. She knew, though, that her night checks often disturbed him. If he was sleeping, she didn't want to wake him. So Margie got the baby monitor and went back to bed. When Jake checked on, uh, when Margie checked on Jake early the next morning, she knew she could no longer put off what he'd be, what she'd been avoiding. Hi, Margie, Jake whispered when he saw her. His eyes were barely open, his skin was almost translucent grey, and it stretched so taut on his face Margie could see the perfect contours of his facial bones and his skull. He looked far more like a corpse than Margie wanted to admit. Hey kiddo, she checked him over. 
bustling around the bed like it was a normal day and they were going to do normal things. So you'll never guess the forecast, Margie said. Um, hot? Oh, you guessed. You're so smart. Jake did his best to smile. She watched him watch, uh, she watched him touch his tongue to his, a couple of small cracks on his lips. It obviously hurt him to move his mouth. Margie picked up a tube of lip moisturiser from the, uh, the nightstand and gently applied some to Jake's lips. What should we do first today? Fly to the moon or build a spaceship? You're silly, Jake said. I've been called worse. Margie snapped her fingers. I know. We'll build a robot first, and then he can build the f f spaceship and fly us to the moon. Margie? Margie stopped moving. She looked at him, frowned, then sat on the bed. What, Jake? I don't want to pretend today. <sighs> Margie took a deep breath. She picked up Jake's bony, limp hand. Okay, I won't make you. I don't want you to get mad. Okay. That would be bad, Margie said. Very, very bad, they said together. Then Jake drifted back to sleep. Whew. Wearing an old grey blouse she hadn't put on in years, Margie sat at the dining room table and methodically cut up every one of her smiley face t-shirts. Ch, snip, ch, snip. The sound of the scissors sliding through the fabric and then snapping closed was surprisingly satisfying. Margie lost herself in her, in her task. She cut steadily. Even when Margie's hand muscles started aching, she kept cutting. When she slashed her last happy yellow countenance, she dropped its remains in the pile and carefully placed the scissors next to it. That's when Gillian showed up at the door, as if she knew Margie was going to need support to do what she had to do. Stepping into the living room, Margie motioned for Gillian to come in. As soon as she did, Margie's tears returned and Gillian strode to her. She took Margie's hand and squeezed it. Her chin moved against the top of Margie's head as she chewed gum. Margie smelled winter green. You can do whatever you have to do, Margie, uh, Gillian said. Could she? Margie wasn't so sure. The kids have gone on a day trip with friends, Gillian said. Dave's at work. I'm here. What do we need to do? It's time to call the hospital and arrange for Jake to be taken to the hospice centre. Julian's eyes moistened, but then she brushed her hands together and said, Then let's go sit down and do that. Oh my god. Julian thought the process was going to be complicated. But Dr. Bederman had paved the way for Jake's transfer. All the paperwork was done. They just needed to send an ambulance with a couple EMTs and a hospice nurse. We can have the ambulance there by noon, the administrator told Margie. Thank you, she said not feeling thankful at all. She felt resentful, angry, enraged. How could all the love and caring and positive expectations have brought Jake here? Margie had been so sure she could get him through this. Outside, an ice cream truck went by. The tinkling music sounded strangely ominous. Huh. The ambulance arrived at 11.32. Margie's stomach roiled when she saw it pull up. She couldn't remember the last time she dreaded something as much as she dreaded this. Margie had been checking the baby monitor regularly since she'd made the call. She hadn't heard anything. She looked in once to find Jake's to find Jake curled on his side with Bodie, his shoulders moving unsteadily up and down with his irregular breathing. She thought then about going in to tell him what was going to happen, but she couldn't bring herself to do it. There was so much that she needed to tell Jake. First, of course, she needed to tell him that his father had died. Second, given that his father was dead, she thought she should reveal to Jake the identity of his nightly visitor. Wouldn't it be more comforting to know that his dad loved him so much he orchestrated those visits than it would be to believe in some nameless, faceless friend who lived in a cabinet? Third, she had to tell him where he was going. Oh no. I'm... To like anybody right now on the earth <laughs> who has to like put up with this and, and deal with all this. Like, I'm sure this is very realistic. I'm like this is all very real. And it is it must be terrifying. We will talk about this at the end of the story. I wanna finish now. She'd planned on doing all of this before the ambulance arrived, but now it's too late. 
Okay, so she'd get him settled in hospice before she told him anything else. Margie was pacing in the living room when the ambulance turned into the driveway. Julian sat in the easy chair near the front door, her hands folded in her lap, her eyes closed. For the first ten minutes after Margie had made her call, Julian had tried conversation. She'd attempted to get Margie to talk about how she felt, but Margie wasn't ready to do that, and Julian had correctly interpreted the monosyllabic uh, answers as a plea for silence. Still, she stayed. Margie was grateful for that. Um, she didn't want to talk, but that didn't mean she was strong enough to do what she was doing by herself. I'll get the door, Julian said as the two young blonde EMTs and one dark-haired middle-aged hospice nurse got out of the ambulance. The EMTs lifted a stretcher from the back of the ambulance while the hospice nurse approached the front door. She carried a clipboard and medicine bag. Julian opened the door for the nurse. I'm Julian, friend and neighbour. This is Margie. She's Jake's nan, a uh, guardian. The short woman with a kind round face held out her hand. Margie managed to shake it, but she didn't say anything. What was she supposed to say? Thank you for coming? I'm Nancy, the woman said. She smiled at both Gillian and Margie. She was clearly an experienced hospice nurse. Her smile was just big enough to be friendly, but reserved enough to give def deference deference, sorry, to the situation. I have a couple things for you to sign, Nancy said, said to Margie. The EMTs threw open the secret door and rolled the stretcher through. Its wheels clattered across the threshold, and Margie felt like the house was being invaded by armed intruders. She wanted to fight them off and force them to go away, which was ridiculous because she'd called, she'd called them. Um, just a sec, boys. Nancy held out her clipboard to Margie. Sign here and here for admission and to acknowledge that we'll be providing palliative care only. Then we can get Jake transferred and settled in. Margie signed the papers, keeping her mind as blank as possible. But it wasn't blank enough. She felt like she was signing a piece of paper confessing to a complete and total failure as a caregiver, maybe even as a human being. All right then. Nancy put the forms back on the clipboard. That was easy enough. Let's go see. Jake, shall we? Margie's mu muscles tightened. Gillian obviously sensed it because she reached down and took Margie's hand, helping her out of the chair. You're doing the right thing, she whispered in Margie's ear when Margie stood. This way, Gillian said to the EMTs. She led Margie through the living room and down the hall, stopping in front of Jake's door. She glanced at Margie and waited. Margie opened Jake's door. The second that Margie stepped into the room, she knew. She felt it. Oh my god. There's no way. The room was too still, too empty. Even though Jake's poor depleted body lay in the bed, Jake was gone. <sighs> okay, because Margie turned into a statue in the doorway, Julian had to practically lift Margie and move her aside to allow the EMTs and Nancy to enter the room. Julian didn't say anything. Margie was pretty sure Julian knew Jake was gone too. Nancy must have sensed it as well, because she frowned. Then she strode to the bed and felt Jake's pulse. She looked up to the EMTs and gave them a slight head shake. They stopped wheeling the stretcher and they both stared at the floor. Nancy looked up at Margie. I'm so sorry. He's passed on. Margie nodded. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Margie nodded. For once, her eyes were dry. What she was feeling was too much for ordinary tears. What she was feeling called for a screaming fit or a total mental breakdown. Since now wasn't the time for either of those, she had no response to offer. She was a human void. She wanted to fold into herself and fall into that void. She wanted to let it suck her from this room, from this reality, but she knew she couldn't escape so easily. So Margie forced her legs to work, and she crossed to Jake's bed. His body looked so small and fragile. She leaned over him and pressed her lips onto his forehead. I love you, Jake. I love you so much. Bodhi tickled her chin. Julian came up behind Margie and whispered, Goodbye, Jake. The three medical professionals 
wouldn't have had reason to see anything amiss. For all they knew, it was normal. Even Gillian would not have commented on it. She might have seen it, but she wouldn't attach any meaning to it. Margie, though. Margie would have, but she didn't. Nobody saw. Five people. Five sets of eyes. And none of them noticed the cabinet the little cabinet door was wide open. Okay. That's the end of the real Jake. <sighs> I'm actually, I'm tearing up. That story from start to finish was beautiful. That was honestly a really good story. I really enjoyed that. Not just for the lore aspects of it, but li like the story alone was really good. It was set so well. The characters are so well written. Like Jake's innocence and his innocent logic and just, again, like his smallness and his fragileness just makes the character so amazing and so devastating when he passes. <sighs> that was tough. That was tough to read through. You can probably hear in my voice, my, my like the dryness now in my throat because of how upsetting I found that story. That's crazy. Oh my God. The thing that's getting me about this is um, I mean, we're going to talk about the ending in a minute, but while I'm in a really depressing mood now, um, the thing about this is, you, you know, like, we, we, we've seen a lot of deaths in Five Nights at Freddy's, right? We In the games, um, we know of all these deaths. Um, in, the, in the books, we, we've had quite a few deaths, and none of them, none of them have really been that impactful. None of them had made me tear up like this. This is madness. Like, I am... <laughs> I'm just giving a clap to uh, the writer of this story. Wow. That was really good. That was really... I'm astounded at how good that was. That might genuinely be one of my favourite stories. It might. I mean, I I was really upset when the when uh, Evan died, <laughs> let alone um, let alone Jake. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, okay. So let's think about this. Let's think about lore aspects. We have a few characters here, and this is really interesting. I've got a lot to talk about, actually. I might actually have to talk about it in a separate video, but Jake, clearly, from the Stitch Wraith and from this story, is a parallel to the Crying Child, right? 100%. Uh, Evan is a really weird one, because he is Jake's dad, who is paralleling the Crying Child, therefore he parallels William Afton, but at the same time, he parallels the Crying Child, because Michael parallels Michael, uh, or the older brother, in this book too. Um, so we've got a lot of parallels going on there. Um, now, if you agree with me, if you agree that Jake is in fact the, um, the crying child, the bite of 83 victim, then this means, this statement right here disproves BB Fifth. 100%. The other thing that disproves BB Fifth is the fact that Bite Victim's name is, I am pretty sure, Evan. I am pretty sure. Like, I am now, I am 90% sure. I've seen evidence against it, and I have taken that into account. I am 90% sure that the, the crying child's name is Evan. Um, but this, this line right here, I don't know how to interpret this, but the fact that there are, there are five people, um, and it's not four, and then, you know, like, um, the crying child making up Golden Freddy. I think that's really interesting to note. Anyway, I don't know, I don't understand this ending. Margie, though, Margie would have, but she didn't see. Nobody saw. Wait. Is no one, even Julian would have... Even Julian. 
five people, five sets of eyes, and none of them noticed the... You guys are going to have to tell me what that ending is. I, I don't understand it. But um, I have to end because this is this is a longer video than I than I hoped. Um, thank you guys so much for listening to this audiobook. I really hope you enjoyed uh reading this with me. This is a very good story. Uh, and tell me guys if you also had a a, a reaction as big as mine. <laughs> um, next time we will be reading a, a story that doesn't exist apparently. Okay, well, okay. <laughs> We're reading the last one, Hide and Seek, I think it's called. I believe it is Hide and Seek. Um, and I'm really excited for that one. So make sure you stick around, make sure you subscribe and everything, all the rest, blah, blah, blah. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you later. Goodbye.